Everybody, I hope that you're ready for a brand new talk by Jeremy. <laughs> Thanks, brother. All right. Oh, no, we're actually running late, aren't we? Cool. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is my first year at Tech Phoenix. Anybody else in that same boat? Uh, got one, two, three. Cool. Welcome. Um, we're going to be going over some cool Facebook stuff. we got a smaller group here, so any interaction, any questions, if I talk too fast, if I mumble, yell it out, stop me, call me out, whatever it is. Um, just real quick, uh, what sort of... Uh, businesses or companies are you guys a part of? We could just start here and go around just a couple. A nonprofit. Council. Nonprofit. All right. All right. Education. Education. Learning. Uh, marketing. Okay. Education. Um, I work at a consignment store as a copywriter and a news Nice. Marketing and fire. Okay. Education. Small business IT. Cool. Student. Cool. So if at any point in time you don't see how this could correlate with that. Just stop me. I don't have anything off the top of my head for how it might work with IT for what I'm going to cover, but we can brainstorm. And yeah, maybe we can come up with stuff. That'll be cool. <laughs> cool, cool. So, like I said, any questions come up, just feel free to stop me and uh, and let me know. We'll go here through noon, till noon, and then I got to find a Chipotle, and then I'll be a happy camper. So, my name is Jeremy Montoya. Like I said, I'm stoked to be here. What I do during the day is I help businesses and brands use social media. My niche is people with a personal brand. And I use the things that I help businesses with, and I experiment with them on myself so I can figure out how they work, what works, what doesn't, and try things out. And uh, I get to have a good time with it. Um, yes. So as you guys all know, if you're using social media at any rate, with what gets talked about right now may only last for the next 12 or so months. What I'll be sharing with you here may last for 90 days. Or less. So right now, the strategies and some of the things I'll be sharing, they absolutely do work and can work for your business with enough elbow grease and the right time put into it, the right passion. Um, but the reality is that if we're playing in someone else's game, playing in someone else's house, like we are with Facebook for this conversation, Facebook can take that away. They could require you to pay for certain parts of it. So we've all experienced that, seen that in the news recently. So just keep that in mind. Um, with any social media presentation you'll be attending, and most definitely with this one, because the stuff that works will eventually not work because everyone will start doing it, and we'll all start understanding it, and we'll all begin to think it's BS like most of the other stuff quickly becomes, and then there, there goes our fun, all right? So I want to share just some ideas for us to get talking about with ways we can start to think outside of the page. Thinking in the sense of, what forms our community and what forms the culture of our brand or our business or our nonprofit? What does the content taste like? What's the meat? We're going to talk a little bit about exclusivity and how that can work for you a little bit on social media in terms of growing your Facebook group. We're going to also dive into what's not seen on Facebook, but we're going to go below the line, kind of behind the scenes, talk about some stuff that, that you can do on the back end. And then all throughout it, my goal is just to tie this to the bigger picture in your business or in the community that you're trying to create and foster and grow on Facebook and really any other social network or, or human network that you're a part of or, uh, or trying to build. How many times do we see this in the news or in newspapers when they come to our town or when a new iPhone gets released? It's crazy, right? Places like Apple and other ones that come to mind, like Whole Foods, a grocery store, are doing amazing jobs, even without social media, of creating community. It's just a freaking phone. And people take the day off work, they stay up all night, they blog about it, they podcast about it, and we have a gathering place for that thing. How convenient. And the people that own it are the people that make that product. Building a community and forming a culture, whether you are doing a trick or a strategy or just growing your presence on any social network, the culture is the key. And what's cool is we're going to do some, some brainstorming here today for how you can kind of interject or create the culture or help foster that engagement with your crowd. But uh, Apple does some smart things in, in the simplicity of what they do. Whether you like them as a company or use their products or not, you really do have to admire the kind of people they attract to them and the amount of people that they attract them at a time. 
And yes, this is overseas, and yes, there are a lot more people in these countries than there are here, but the picture is no different at every local Apple store, all right? Just keep that in mind. So when we're thinking uh, community, in terms of growing that on Facebook, it's essential to people actually hearing your messages because likes don't matter. Likes don't pay the bills. Retweets don't pay the bills. Having followers, none of those things pay the bills. So we have to think in, in terms of community so we can grow, grow that following and eventually have a call to action, whether that's to go to your site, purchase whatever you're selling or trying to use to change their life. Um, one of the ways, like I said, that's working right now for me and others are Facebook groups. See, the page is no longer the place that you want to engage with your audience. Why do you think that might be? You had one. Uh, just the groups. I mean, obviously, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're all talking about the same subject matter, so they're something they're interested in. Most definitely. Another huge reason, if you've used Facebook or have been building a fan page at any rate, is Facebook wants for you to pay to have exposure to their audience. Although it's a segment of their audience, it's your audience, it's their audience. And Facebook understands that, and they have shareholders, and they have an entire corporate system behind them, like this beautiful country does, that requires for you to have to, to pay to make those things happen. Now, in doing that, if you don't pay, you can still reach people. But you're reaching less and less people as Facebook wants more and more and more of your dollars. Will that ever change and get easier and go back to the way it was? I don't know. But a page is not the place, unfortunately, where the engagement is taking place. Can it take place there? Yes. People commenting on, on a post your business page puts out or um, sharing a post that you put out. But it's happening far less and less, even to the big brands and even to the big names. What's unique about a Facebook group, this is where it gets kind of fun. If you can imagine you're on Facebook, you're a part of a group, and somebody posts inside of there. Maybe it's the admin, or maybe it's just a person with a question or with an inspirational image. Every single time that group gets an update, what happens to your Facebook feed? What happens to the little notification area on your Facebook bar? It updates, and it tells you that somebody posted. That doesn't happen when you post your business page on Facebook. That doesn't happen when you post even to your personal page. If people are wanting to hear, they like every one of your statuses. But if they're in a group, they're telling Facebook they're a part of a tribe, they're a part of a community that means something to them. Now, if you're subscribed and, and in 140 groups, you're going to have notifications all day long because those groups have a lot of conversation going on. But what's great, nonetheless, in the groups you matter about, you're going to be notified. Like I said, that disclaimer, this works right now. Facebook could change this with groups with one flick of a wand. They could be working on it right now. We finish the presentation, wake up tomorrow, and you got to pay to have a group, to host a group, or you have to pay to get more exposure to them. What's cool about, if you think in terms of community, whether it's in a group or not, is that it can have kind of like a, an online club type feel. You know, if you think back to maybe high school or any one of those things, and you're a part of a club or an after school club, you were a part of something bigger. You were a part of something that wasn't just you. And that can happen if you facilitate it correct on Facebook. I heard that some of the, that, um, there are already high deaths from other clubs that Facebook is. And I mean, if you get too big and you get too much going on, they can force you to change. I mean, anything is possible, right? Like when you're in someone else's house, you have to play by their rules. And that can absolutely happen. And it may be already happening on Facebook. But, but there are some cool things that, that can still come from groups and having a very large group. Um, I was listening to a story the other day about a woman who has a, uh, I think it's a business coaching program, and she started a group around the law of attraction. Not, name, not naming it out of her business, not wanting to create fans of her business, wanting to bring like-minded people who understood or liked the law of attraction. And it got so big and so many people liked it that it got the attention of Oprah and her staff. And she got an email message wanting for them to collaborate. And now, although that group is being bought by Facebook, Oprah wants to be a part of it. So there are cool things that can come from it on, on either side of the spectrum. Maybe if Facebook ends up making you pay, maybe they give you additional features. Right? Like that would be cool. Maybe they don't take anything away and they give you additional stuff and you can have a pro group or whatever it is. You can change the colors on it, like MySpace. But at the end of the day, uh, you can make it unique to what you're not unique to your brand, but unique to what your brand or business does. 
if I own a construction company, maybe I start a group about restoration, maybe I start a group about woodworking. And here and there I can say things about construction and where to go when you have needs, but maybe I just like this and want to attract people to me that like woodworking. As an owner of, of a construction company, that interests me. I still like doing that on the weekends as my quiet time. I'm not talking about me personally. I'm no woodworker. Not yet. And uh, so you can cater to it very neatly. It doesn't need to be named after your business. It doesn't need to be named after what you do. It can just be simply titled, aimed, or created all around an idea, all around a mindset, or whatever it is that, uh, that you are passionate about. Now, we've kind of resorted back, us humans, to how we do things the old way. If you can imagine when the iPhone came out, it felt and resembled in the software very much what an old phone was. So we could kind of get used to it. And the same thing happens online with social media. When I joined Twitter in 2009, I wasn't one of the earliest people to it. People were actually like using Twitter and like being the person on the side of the keyboard. And now I go into my feed and it's nothing but people tweeting out their own articles or tweeting out their friend's article in a link and some hashtags. And it, it feels more like this. Like I'm going on to read other people's content, their online magazines, so to say. Now, if you understand that, that us humans do that, and we're going to take something physical, and if we make it digital, it's going to be very similar, at least when it starts out, then you can take that idea and kind of in, introduce it into your content. So if you're running a group, or even a page on Facebook, you can begin to think of it kind of like an online magazine. Think about your favorite magazine growing up. Many of us don't read magazines anymore. And think about what they did inside of there, how they featured other people who had an idea on sports and they had a sports article, right? Or they featured a big name who knew style and they would report in Cosmo. They maybe weren't a staff member, but they knew something about that topic, so the magazine would feature them. Think about how you could do that in a group on Facebook. Again, this is all referring right now, but at least this first part, two groups. But nonetheless, you can make it to where people look forward to have an appointment with you in their Facebook feed because you do something every day at, on Mondays at 10 a.m., whatever it might be. You can do articles. You can make something more frequent. Think like a podcast or a TV show, as you know, it's 3.30, Channel 10, Judge Judy. I don't know if that's still it. It used to be when I was younger. But... People have an appointment. They can have an appointment with you. They can have an appointment with your group or with your tribe. They can be much bigger than, than you and, uh, and just your passion. Other people can get involved. And then you can get people involved by fostering that engagement. And that really comes down to how you balance giving and asking. How much you ask of the people you're around. This is regardless of a Facebook group. How much you ask of the people on your email list or in your business or, or all those things. How much do you give them? Do you give up front? Do you give them something of value for an exchange? When they sign a group, do they... Do, they, do you give them something, something to inject inside of there? But all of those things, they set the foundation for the community that you are that you are trying to grow. Any questions at this point yet on groups or, or any pictures coming to mind in the visualization for how that might look like for, for a nonprofit or you know, for a learning institute? IT? I'm good, man. All right, cool. <laughs> So this definitely isn't mine or my grandparents' country club. But nonetheless, country clubs draw certain types of people, regardless of what we see here, because they are exclusive. You gotta got pay something, whether that's money or time or knowledge, you have to put something on the line to join. And you know that on the other side of the door are other people just like you, other people who have laid something on the line maybe have similar interests or similar outlook on life. Country clubs do a good job of bringing those sort of people together and then figuring out how to amplify it to create events, to create community, and to create engagement. So, so think about what might be exclusive about your group. Is it private? Do they have to buy a course and then they get, uh, as a part of that cost in the course, they get access to a limited Facebook group where you had to be a part of that course? or you had to get to a certain part of the course? Does your audience need to do something before being accepted? Do they have to submit a survey? Do they have to do a testimonial, anything? Or is it just an open group? Who hands down isn't allowed? Who is allowed? What's said? What can't be said? And, and most important of all of this, I wish I would have folded it, is what's encouraged. 
On Facebook, posting is encouraged. Liking is encouraged. Commenting is kind of encouraged. What are you encouraging your group? How do you make your group just a little bit different from the rest of the Facebook experience, but using their platform? Is it commenting? Is it sharing? Is it on Tuesdays you want everybody to put a quote in this, in this post? Or have your own post and put your quote, and the best quote gets pinned up at the top of the page, and you get a t-shirt when, when your quote gets featured or whatever. What's encouraged? How are you getting people to talk? How are you getting people to share? Exclusivity, that mindset to help make that happen, whether it's in regards to money and, and charging to get in, or just in the context of what you have in your group once they get to the side of it. Now we're going to talk. Any questions on exclusivity or any thoughts? We're going to talk for a few minutes now and go below the line on Facebook. So we're going to transition a little bit out of groups now, and we're going to talk about how you can get some more exposure uh, through some of the tools Facebook offers. Should have done this at the beginning, but I figured it's pretty popular. Who here has a Facebook? Okay. Has anyone in here ever paid to boost a post on a page to get more eyes to it? Okay, some experimenting. Have clients have done it with some okay, there's a lot of stories about it doing really well for certain businesses, for certain industries and niches, um, and there are also some stories in how much money you can waste. They, to clarify, they spent seven hundred dollars. They worked with Facebook, and they really helped them because I, I do PR, and I was trying to sell them. You know, they had the second location. I said, nobody gives a damn if you have a second location. I mean, I'm sorry I'm going to be really blunt. Nobody knows you well enough. They care more what you do. And, you know, because they were going to put out a direct mail campaign. You have a second location. I'm like, who the hell cares? They don't know about your, your first location. But they, yeah, so so Facebook was able to tell them, and they, they have a pretty expensive product, and they are booked for a month out. Wow. But they work every week with you. One on one for an hour, and you know, and if you do that, you well worth your. And then they teach you how to do it on your own, and you do a lot less after that. That's pretty cool. So that was a good, you know, really good. Some say they yeah. work with Facebook they, does. Oh, um, they have like a a, a, you have a personal a personal representative that works with you for an hour. Uh -huh. Yep, and cool. they and they go over your your keywords and your messaging and all of it, so that in your images, so that you can succeed at it. That's right, and I haven't heard of that personally, so it's really cool to hear that they do have some help like that because a lot of companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, you can't get a, there's no phone number to dial, there's nowhere, you have a question, hopefully it's solved in a support area, right? If, if you want it, I have the phone number because I don't know necessarily how to get the paper. Sweet. <laughs> so, and, and for what they were helping out with, chances are it wasn't for the normal boosting of a post. Because I can put, you know, if I update my Facebook fan page, and I put a post on there and I wanted to get more engagement, I can throw $10 or I can throw $700 at it. And I kind of get some parameters. I can choose distance and proximity. I can choose interest. I can choose age, gender, some very basic things. Um, all very easy if you know what you're doing to, to get eyeballs and attention to it. If you don't, it's a very easy way to just shotgun your money into the cyber abyss. All right? So when I talk below the line on Facebook, because Facebook makes money off of advertising, where do you think they put all their attention? Hands down, it, like their ad platform is better than Facebook itself. Now, the biggest component of this is called an unpublished post. So right now, if you posted something on your fan page, that's it. You, I think you have a certain window of time, unless people like it and comment it, to change the copy of it. Maybe you had a misspelling, you can go easily delete it. Maybe the link got updated, it's wrong now, you can go and paste a, an updated link. But an unpublished post is cool because it's below the line, and you can choose who sees it. Meaning, you can make a unique version of this, and I can only have this back table see it. While all of you guys are fans and would be seeing more normal stuff, I can make something to go and test against other people that aren't a fan of me yet, or that are a fan of my competitor, or that have used my competitor, or that have mentioned my business in a comment before. Unpublished posts are cool because it gives you some amazing tools to market. For what you get in a normal boosting of a post, I can go into the back end of what's called the power editor in Facebook, and I can find the one person in Tempe wearing a red button-down shirt with a white big pen, writing on a notebook, a brown leather-bound notebook, and Facebook's going to go find the two people in Tempe that are doing that. 
it's, it's scary. It is scary how much they know about us, but it's powerful if you're a marketer, and it's powerful if you have something that's gonna change someone's life, or if you have a copy that's gonna allow for people to understand what it is that you're offering. What's cool too is that when you do an unpublished post, they don't flood your page, so you don't have 10 versions of join my webinar, or sign up for class, or, or whatever your call to action is, and you can test it. And the most important thing to understand, if you take away one thing from an unpublished post on Facebook, is that it allows you to change the copy of your ads. I can now go and make two versions of this brochure that I want to market out, and I can test them to the same market. And I can see which converts worse. This one sucked. I'm going to go with this one. I'm going to take this one, I'm going to post this on my page, and I'm going to throw $1,000 of my ad budget behind it, because I know this one converts more than any others. It's very complicated to answer if I had the whole time of this conversation to be able to do it, or this presentation. Um, but they, they provide the tool in the back end that allows you to very easily uh, create a mock post, figure out what it would look like, to track it, to do all of that. Um, now, I could go into how to do all of that nuts and bolts, but I'll be God honest with you, I don't even do it myself. And, and there's a reason why. Yes? So when you say doesn't flood your page, are you talking about a page now or a group? Or either? We transition from groups and we're talking okay. now about like more like a fan page and how those posts work. This would only be for a fan oh, page. Okay. Exactly, not for groups, not for personal profile pages, only for like a business or a fan page. Um, this is all about how you can test your ads and get them more exposure by throwing more money at it, making custom, super custom ads. Uh -huh. So when you do that to promote the live stuff, but that's paid for then? It's paid for. You don't have to pay to start making your ads. You don't have to pay for access to the power editor Facebook has. But you do have to pay once you want that to start going into the wild and testing. So that's how much do you pay when you want to test? I think my next slide will have answer that. Just a little bit. All right. Okay. We'll get that because it's, it's a good topic. There's another name for unpublished posts that is very widely used. And it's dark posts. And I can't find any other reason why besides there is a dark side to that. So an unpublished post is fun because I can test my copy. I can find new people if I have the right ad budget and the right people defined in my demographic. But that takes hours and hours of research, a lot of expertise, and I'm not the right person for that. Don't get me wrong. But uh, still very powerful. So here's my at least word word of wisdom. Outsource it because you will spend more importantly than your money your hours and hours of your life trying to figure this stuff out and probably still wasting money afterwards. So there's a lot to learn with dark posts and the way the marketing and the advertising works. There's a lot of data that can come from it. In Facebook, there's a place called Insights where you can see and track and measure different groups of people on Facebook, whether they're yours or not, and then you can take those and run them behind your ad, again, where it gets powerful. But there's just so much data there's just so many numbers, there's so many points that are all extremely relevant, but what is most relevant to you and your business and your end user, it leaves, it leaves some debate. And, and dark posts or those unpublished posts, to answer your question, it's a very easy way to shop your money out. It's a very easy way to just watch your dollars get lost unless you spend some time learning in there. And there are free courses, there are paid courses, there are people who will consult you, people who will do it for you. Um, if, you really, if you really want for them to be powerful and you want to stick to my goal is to stick with what I'm good at, and I'm not good with the data personally. I can make sense of it once someone has kind of figured it all out, but sorting through it, not my strength. Find someone to outsource it to if you really want them to grow your business, because like I said, whether you're doing it with $5 or $10, you can run a good ad. You can get a lot of good results, or you can run with $500 or $1,000 and see absolutely not. So you're saying if you, um, they let you play with this stuff until you get ready to they just don't charge you to run, to use their their online platform for the ads. So you can go and you can make a hundred ads, try some stuff out, and then when the ad budget comes in or when the this calendar changes and the new budget opens up, you can then go and put dollars behind it. Um, Google it, check it out, find videos on it, immerse yourself in it if it's of interest. Like I said, if you're anything like me and you started a business or or you want to spend as much as your free time from the job doing things that you love with your family. If this is one of the things that you love, then by all means have at it. Um, but it, it can be, a, unfortunately, a huge time suck and, and take away from the things that are usually most important. So it sounds like that thing for $700 might 
it might be very useful to some people if, if they have the time to then facilitate it and then you know take what Facebook tells you. Um, it all depends on the business owner and where they're at in terms of money and funds because dark posts are cool too, but sometimes just a, a boosting of a post can do it. If you get the copy down right or you test it in other places, you don't necessarily need these, but it's a marketer's dream. Any questions on those? Check them out. So we keep coming back to the disclaimer because technology is moving faster than ever. Um, anyone heard of Humans of New York? Yeah. Okay. So it's a cool like phenomenon going on by a gentleman in New York City where he started uh, interviewing random people, whether they were homeless or a cop or a Navy SEAL walking down the street. And uh, he started thinking he's a photographer, took pictures, put a whole book together, did a Kickstarter, did Indiegogo, did all of those things, and created a huge movement out of it. And uh, he was talking with someone who had just retired early from the IT sector. And he asked him why he retired early, for whatever reason. And the gentleman said, because technology is moving too fast. And I just can't keep up with it. When I started in this industry, something would come in, we'd have it for 10 or 15 years. When something comes in now, we might have it for 10 or 15 months maximum. And that caused him to end up leaving IT, that speed. And social media is no different than IT and in terms of the technology. It's moving faster and faster every single day. That Bill Gold post is just moving for us as marketers and for us trying to affect our communities. So we have to figure out um, some ways around it. We have to have a goal in mind. We have to have a bigger picture in mind. We have to have all of that laid out because it, it could be the next thing Facebook comes out with next month that's called Facebook Communities. And groups, now you gotta pay. And Facebook community is free, but you only get this stuff, or this portion of stuff. You gotta have a goal in mind, because that field goal is gonna be constantly moving. And I'm a 49er fan, so I had to use this image. So, now we're gonna kinda shift away from talking about Facebook. And I know this presentation is about using Facebook for your growth. But if you don't have some of these ideals integrated in your business, Facebook doesn't even matter. Facebook is just a place people can see your images, maybe like your quote, maybe make you feel special when, when you do get those engagements. But if you don't have a place where you can stay in contact with those people that you own, that you can take with you, we talked about this a little bit in the last podcasting presentation, then you're going to lose. Or you're at least not going to win. Think about how you can set up a process or an experience for your customers or for, you, for your users to go through once they find you, whether it's on Twitter or a Facebook group or on Facebook. You have to create a sequence, almost a game plan, to get them out of that environment that's owned by someone else and get them into your house. Because once you get them into your house, you have an opportunity to stay in contact with them. You can create an opportunity to continue to engage with them. And there are may be more ways down the road, but the most tried and true right now are these top two. And, and more used is this top one. Having an email list in place to capture the first name of your potential customer and the email of your potential customer is the most powerful thing that you can do for your business. If Facebook goes away, you can send an email. Whether it's one at a time or as a big blast group using MailChimp or one of those services. You can print out that list and take it with you. God forbid something happened and all technology wiped out. Or a fire happened, God forbid. You have that list with you, you can open it up and you can individually call or email or be in contact with them and say, hey, I had an unfortunate event happen. My website just got hacked. Or hey, the podcast went down. Here's where you can listen in the meantime. Or hey, I'm not over here, I'm over here now. I'm not on Facebook groups anymore. I'm over on Twitter groups now because it's new and it's popping over there. Go and join you can tell them where you're at. If you only have fans and followers on Facebook, if you only have fans and followers on Twitter, if you only have fans and followers subscribe to you on YouTube, you're not gonna win in the long run. It's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they own that. They own your following. SoundCloud owns your audio, whether you're a musician or a podcaster. What's gonna become big, if you listen to podcasts or if you're in the, in the marketing world, text messaging, it's crazy, it hasn't blown up already, it is begun, going to become huge. Text groups to 885549 and you'll sign up to our group. 
boom, someone's driving to hear that in a podcast, or someone's reading on a blog, or someone's communicating with a business client or a friend, oh yeah, just text this number. And then you get their email, then you get their name, now you get their number. Imagine what you can do now, having that person's information in an intimate place, like an email inbox, which still is. What's your way for converting? Getting people on Facebook to one of those? You just ask for it and want them to post it publicly? Or? I mean, you, that, that's one way, and you might get a couple people, you might get some friends. That, that's a bad way. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a bad way because you're not giving value first. That's my way. Right. Whatever, whatever that way is, I, I try to give value. Whether it's, here's an inspirational post, and I hope you like it enough to go and follow and join my email list. Or if it's, hey, I prepared for you uh, the five steps to getting more out of your Facebook groups. Go to jeremymontoya.me slash groups, where you can go and download that for free. And then when you get there, it shows you an image of it, shows you what you're getting, it looks, looks familiar to the conversation. So you like sending uh, them to a personal website, Matt? You always want to get them to your house. Sure. You always want to get them over to you. Whether that's you and a clipboard or that's you and a website, you always want to get them over. And you can just have an email list and not have a place where you're saying, here, go and get this free download. Just give me your name and email or your email or your number. Um, but the, the likelihood of someone subscribing and then staying subscribed is very minimal. If, you're, if the person that has you on Facebook is coming over to you and they're beginning to know you more, like you and trust you, and they want to learn more from you, then they may stick around on your list longer. They may want whatever ends up coming after this when I say this was the five ways to grow your groups, but here's the number one way to grow your business, and this is just $49. It could be, you know what I mean, like a sequence. You want to create an experience for those people that come from your social networks, regardless of it's Facebook, but you have to, have to, have to give value. Whether it's give them a PDF version of a blog post you did, or the copy for your top five converting ads, or starting your own IT business. The three things new IT entrepreneurs don't consider. If you have people that are interested in that and engage in that, they're gonna want that. Yeah, lead pages and digitalmarketer.com teach the best models. Oh yeah. Most of it's free. So look it up, digitalmarketer.com and leadpages.net. Absolutely. I, I use lead pages personally and I absolutely love it. Um, there are free ways of doing it, like MailChimp. Uh, there are some you know, workarounds and things like that, but nonetheless, uh, find a way to stay in contact that you own, that you can print, that you can take with you, that belongs to you and is your property. And the, and the most, the newest edition, although text is very, very new, having an app for creating an experience where someone can go and interact with you on their smartphone whenever they want and have some cool exclusive things like we talked about is also a very, very powerful way to grow engagement with your audience to continue that conversation and to overall create an experience, regardless of where that person finds you or you find them. The end goal should be the same, trying to change their life through, through your passion, through your knowledge, through what you offer, and these are just some of the ways that you can do it. What questions do you guys have or what comments or what things come to mind for you guys when you're thinking your Facebook page and growing your community? Does that mean Creating the experience, can you share with us, like, I mean, like, when you have done it with athletes, like, what kind of experience do you have with your followers, and what kinds of, um, how do we, you know, make that more personal for ourselves? It, it can be a, a combination of things, or it can be very, very simple. Um, what was cool is, from my experience at Apple, I learned very, very quickly how important the customer experience is, and how important it is to be strategic with it, and, and to make it unique, and to make it a, a eye-opening, aha experience. Um, there are many ways that you can do that, but if you can make someone feel a certain way, they're gonna remember you forever. They'll never forget your name. Um, some ways to do that, like we said, it can be a PDF or it can be a video series. It can be like, here's, here's the three videos to learn whatever it is that you're teaching. Maybe it's to, we used woodworking earlier. Here's a way to build a table this weekend. Download it now. They put in their name and their email. And then they get that, they go through it, and they make that table, and they're wowed. And then in their inbox that Monday coming up is another email that's comparing or that's saying, have you thought about this with your wood table? Or here's the next project. And if you can engage with that right audience and make that experience, that funnel, top, top to bottom, it's going to be unique for every single person, then you're in business. Then you have a way that people are definitely, one, not going to forget you, and two, want to hear what you have to say. 
But when Apple starts creating those experiences, they didn't just pull out of the sky, I think we'll create this experience. How did they collaborate first with potential users so that they would create the experience the users already told them they wanted? Or, I mean, the understanding, you can't just say, I think they'd like strawberry rhubarb pie, and then you find out that, that nobody <laughs> likes it. You know, I mean, they didn't do it in a vacuum. So how do you... I'm glad you said that. Okay. And there's only one way that that happens, and that's experimenting. That's why I, I put in the dark posts and, and uh, the unpublished post in, information here because experimenting is the best thing that you can do because you know I could sit down with someone here and we could brainstorm a genius experience top to bottom and then we try it out and it doesn't work. And it might not work because of the beginning part or the middle part or the end part, but you start testing and tweaking and figuring out what does work for you step by step, over time you create it. The thing about Apple too is they didn't happen overnight. You know, and their first take, if you look at their first stores compared to what the stores they're building are now, they're completely different, right? Like they've been completely more to change. And that should be the same of, of us as individuals as well as our businesses as we're figuring some stuff out. Ex experimenting is the cornerstone of my life. And it really should be for our businesses if we want them to work out or for our social media presence to work out because then we can figure what works only through testing it against something else. Apple is big in that, they have select stores that only do these certain things, or always trying things out in different markets and stores. The thing about Apple is they understand the human psychology. They understand what makes us tick and trip, so to say. Um, and they use that, not only the experience of what you're gonna have in their store, but all the way from how the phone feels when you take it out of the box, how it feels when you have your hand taken off the plastic, all of that is considered. And all that's tried and tested over time. And over time, they have a phone that hits the masses and even people in countries that don't have enough money to pay rent you know, end up having these. That's just the just reality of, of their scale in the long run. But experimenting is hands down. It's hands down that way to start. So is there a role for survey, like survey monkey or Wookie or something at the meantime? Absolutely. So it's, a, it's actually a great starting point. Imagine if you have an email list and you want to know with what your end user is struggling with because maybe you haven't experimented yet and know what they're failing with. And you get an email back that says, I'm struggling finding a job. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I'm scared. And, and you can take their words and over time create something for them. Maybe it's a blog post, okay, well, we'll check this out. Or maybe you start a podcast because you realize more and more people have that issue, right? They can't find jobs. They're scared once they get there because it's been so long since an interview. And over time you create this community because you tested, you're able to figure those things out. So I am a huge proponent. I showed it in that last presentation too. If you can start by experimenting instead of saying, Here's my perfect edition, first time, I'm ready to hit the presses, I'm ready to hit Facebook and throw thousands of dollars behind it, you're, ne you're never gonna win. You're just gonna lose a ton of money and time. So experiment, have it, have it in mind that the first trial of something probably isn't gonna work out. But if you know that from the beginning, that's the expectation, you can kind of figure that out along the way. I hope that helps. Sweet, I'm wrapped up. So if you do have questions or if you guys wanna mingle afterwards, I'd love to help in any way that I can, and uh, but yeah, more than free to go and grab lunch and, and do any of those fun things. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your input, brother. <laughs> Is there a cheap hold me nearby and may I buy you lunch if you can drive me there? Because my husband drove me off. No, no question at all. There's one right here down the street. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you would all might not want lunch with me, but I'm No, no, I'm, I'm more, more than happy. Let me get unplugged here. So what's the main way you make your living? You don't talk at Camp Phoenix. No, it's your pain, right? Yeah. Um, most of this you're helping other brands and businesses with, with these concepts. So is it with digital marketing specifically or just or an aspect of digital marketing? Because it's a very broad topic. What's selling right now is social media. Mm -hmm. It's so new and interesting. Uh -huh. uh, but what, what my passion is and what I'm best at is building audiences regardless of the social media, uh -huh. talking through what we were doing here, like with the email list and creating those experiences, like all of that is what really gets me jazzed of what, I'm, what I you feel best teaching at. teaching people to build those audiences for their business? Or, or consulting or... them how to do it, or, uh, or, or okay. even having the team that executes it for them if they don't okay. want to spend the time on it. There's a lot of ways. And are you a lone ranger, or do you have sort of a satellite uh, universe of people who help with uh, that? I have a, I have a small team. Oh, it absolutely is. Don't get me wrong. Are you, are you here in Phoenix or San Francisco? Or? I'm in Chandler. Okay. I wish I was in San Fran. That'd be really cool. Yeah, why were you living in the city? I, I grew up uh, in the Bay Area. Okay. That's where I started my career. 
Um, I was born in California, and my parents moved when I was four, so I didn't have a say in it. Where were you born in California? I was born in L.A., yep, I was all over okay. Southern California, yep, and then uh, my dad bought a 49 Chevy when he was 19 and kind of passed, passed the whole 49 thing on, so. I want a 55 Chevy Apache. Oh, my goodness. That's my that would be That would be amazing. But yeah, to answer the question, most people right now are interested in paying for social. Yeah. They don't want to pay for the unfun stuff, but that's the stuff that really ends up building well, the, a viable the business. The dilemma is when you're building business, uh, once upon a time I published a newspaper, which still exists, obviously, the Codley newspaper. When people would advertise in my paper, the comment was, and it's a classic at all advertising, half of what I spend on advertising doesn't work. The problem is I don't know which half. <sighs> And that today, with all of these analytics and tracking, it's a little easier to do that. But when people want to contract, uh, say, a social media strategy for their business, how do I know? Where that goes? Yeah. You know, I'm paying for this, and what what am I going to, what return am I going to get for that? So, big question. That's really big question. And, and there aren't answers a lot because it is still the wild class. So. It, is, uh, it can be hard to trust and very easy to waste dollars. That's true. Well, and yeah, and some people overstate what they can do. Yeah, no. They might be better at one thing than another. Oh, yeah. I think you need both. I'm Brian. 